Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm glad you're here. For the show today, we're going to welcome back coaches Sheldon Dunlap and Jeff Hauser. Sheldon Dunlap is currently serving as a strength and conditioning specialist with the Marine Special Operations Command, and previously Sheldon held positions at UC Davis and interned at Duke University. Jeff Hauser is a speed and performance coach with strong roots in track and field. Jeff spent the previous 20 seasons as Duke's speed and conditioning coach, and he's trained a number of high-level track and field athletes as well. Back on episode 131 of the podcast, Sheldon Dunlap appeared and amongst other training topics was talking a lot about oscillatory reps in strength training. And so he was talking about the oscillatory reps and the really positive impact it had with his track and field athletes. Oscillatory reps or oscillatory strength training is, as opposed to doing a full range up and down repetition, so let's just say in a squat, it would be going down into depth in the squat and then doing smaller, quicker pulses of work. So small, short range of motion repetitions and then combining those with an explosive full range rep. So just think quick pulsing repetitions in a strength training movement. And Sheldon actually had learned that style. The first ob- uh, observation of that style came from his time interning at Duke, where he learned it from Jeff Hauser. And when Jeff was on the show recently, we talked about a lot of speed training concepts. But the one thing we didn't talk about uh, on the recording of the show that actually Jeff and I chatted about later was oscillatory strength training. And Jeff was talking about some of the results he was getting with it. So I thought it'd be a really cool idea to get these two together. Sheldon has definitely advanced his knowledge of the method since the last time he was on the show. Jeff has a huge library of knowledge on the concept, and we'll be talking about all things oscillatory training for the show today, such as how do you use the method throughout the year? What is the coaching and different execution styles of the oscillatory method? How do you integrate it with the rest of the training program? and so much more. It was really fun having these guys on the show. Before we get started, just a quick word from our sponsors. So our first sponsor is Team Builder. Team Builder is an online software for coaches and trainers. And whether you are looking for an in-house training portal or an online training hub, be sure to check out the Team Builder training software. Our second sponsor for today's show is the Sprint Acceleration Essentials online course. This is my latest release, and I'm really proud of it. Sprint Acceleration Essentials is a speed training course with a focus on acceleration development. And it's much more than that, as within the course, there are many important concepts to athletic movement, human performance, and skill building in general. Some of these concepts include the rotational dynamics in locomotion, motor learning concepts, understanding the connection between structure and alignment and an athlete's technique, factors of specificity in strength training and plyometrics, and more. This is a speed and human movement training course that will leave you with a thorough understanding of the dynamics of acceleration and speed training while giving you a bigger lens of the process to help you break through sprint plateaus, get better results, and have more fun along the way. You can check out the course by heading to justflysports.com and click on the banner, and I'll see you on the inside. That being said, let's get to episode 372 here with Sheldon Dunlap and Jeff Hauser. Sheldon, Jeff, welcome to the show. Great to have you guys here. Um, So... It's interesting. I know Sheldon and I had you on the show a long time ago, Jeff much more recently. Uh, And then Sheldon, you had mentioned in that first podcast we did that when you were working with Jeff at Duke, that's where he taught you the oscillating rep type scheme or the oscillating rep type stuff. And so uh, tell me a little bit about the work you guys did together. I think Sheldon, you were um, assistant coach or uh, intern in some capacity. Tell me a little bit about your time together at Duke and maybe also where you guys are now. Uh, Not the whole journey, but I I think we're both in a different place than we were last time we did the podcast. Uh, yeah. So, um, man, back at Duke, when I was learning it from Duke, when I was, when I was at Duke, I was an intern and I was an intern at Duke for two and a half years. So pretty long time to be an intern, but it was, it, it paid dividends to get to where I'm at now. And I guess currently I work with Marine Special Operations Command in their POTIF program. And I guess I also need to say this, so I had to slide this in there, that my opinions are of my own and not that of the Special Operations Command, Marine Special Operations Command, or the United States Marine Corps. So sorry, I, I meant to throw that in there. I'm, I'll give you a, a warning of that, but sorry. Yeah, um, under, yeah there you go. Under, official <laughs> official, official uh, notice, definitely understand. Yes, yeah. And yeah, so I, I, when I was there, I was just, at do doing it being an intern working with almost every team that we had on the floor and with with hauser it was with uh field hockey and i want to say women's lacrosse 
is where I first saw him doing like those are the two one of the uh, those are two of the teams that he had that I was also helping him with at the time, and that's where I initially saw him doing Aussie reps like oscillating reps. And again, at at the time, I did had no idea what it was or what it was what it was doing. Not until years later, when I was at UC Davis, that I connect the dots. Was like, oh, that's what that's what that was. And from there, I understood the concept. It clicked in my head, and it just kind of went running with it. Yeah. So it's funny, you know, with the the two and a half years for being an intern, I would say, you know, maybe that's a record, but I hear from, from my, what I understand, some people actually have to go through the intern cycle a lot longer um, than that. So, you know, Jeff, tell me a little bit too. I think um, you've moved into a little bit different position since your time at Duke, uh, working with some different populations now. Curious what you're up to with that. Well, basically I have, um, I am training some athletes on the side, basically as individually. But what I'm mainly doing right now is working with an older population in continuing care facilities. Um, some's park, some of them are Parkinson's patients, some of them are PSP. Uh, some of them have um, you know, different, different conditions, different physical conditions. But uh, I've begun training them very much like I did athletes when I was coaching them at, at the collegiate level. Uh, they, had the same inter- they have the same nervous system. They have the same muscle. They basically system that they had when they were 20 years old. And basically just waking their nervous system up, uh, beginning to train them a little bit faster, a little more ballistic nature, eccentric type training instead of static, isometric type training. Um, I tell them all, I said, there's nothing slow about falling down. So I need to be able to, to train you so that in case you do lose your balance, you know, how do you, how do you get your body? How do, how do you control and maintain and manage momentum that you have going toward the ground? So a lot of it's momentum based. Um, I have learned a lot training the older population. There's some things that I wish I had known when I was training, you know, the collegiate athletes that I have found out since I've been training the the older Mm. population, but getting some very good results and uh, very gratifying too. Um, It's great to see, you know, people kind of gain part of their life back again. So um, training um, a a former Olympian from Australia and a couple of baseball players. So I've got a, pretty full palette right now. Yeah. So I, you know, I was just thinking, um, as Sheldon, as you were saying, you, you know, you're an intern at Duke and I'd imagine when you start out in strength and conditioning, you, I think there's probably things you expect to see, you know, traditional sets and reps and tempos and things like that. Um, I can only imagine you're seeing athletes doing like quick oscillating reps. Like what in the world is this? Uh, I'm curious, you know, Jeff, and we didn't get to this in the last uh, episode we recorded, but uh, I know we talked about it a lot, I think, after the show was over. Uh, but I'm curious how you got started with oscillating reps, because until, um, you know, Sheldon had talked about it a few years back when he was a, a guest on the podcast. I've seen Cal Dietz use it. I've seen, <clears throat> I've seen like Jay Schrader using a lot of uh, like static dynamic and, and quick based iterations of lifting. But I, I don't, I'm not sure that I had really seen the oscillating stuff until maybe five or six years ago. And with that being said, you know, I'm curious, um, actually maybe it was more like, maybe more like 10, but regardless, like I didn't see this stuff in the year 2000 and <laughs> mid nineties when I was research doing all the training research so that we didn't really have the internet to do that back then. But uh, when, when did you get started on the oscillating rep idea? Like, did you learn it from somebody? Um, just what, what year did that come about for you? Um, well, early on when I was at Duke, um, the the third time I went to Duke, actually, okay. I was track coach there twice before. Um, when I went as a, a speed agility conditioning coach initially, and then became a strength conditioning coach uh, on the strength side later on, we had a an assistant uh, named Ryan Feek, and he had been at the University of Wisconsin with Jim Schneider. He had been at at Minnesota with Cal. Okay, Leeds. got it. Um, and um, he was there for three years, and um, Basically, at that time, nobody was really using oscillating uh, lifts very extensively. So we just started messing around with it and playing around with it. And I had a couple of guys that I had, I was training that were kind of my guinea pigs. They were not Duke athletes. They were, they were athletes outside of uh, the university. And so I started trying it with them and um, it was working very, very well. They were getting very, very strong, very quickly. Um, I was able to manipulate some things as far as 
sets, reps, uh, ranges of motion, uh, how you sequence them, basically the rest periods between and what you do between exercises and on days in between. Um, and I, I was able to do it without basically any any restrictions regarding the collegiate schedule. So when we're doing that, uh, Ryan was, uh, we were just kind of consulting on stuff and, you know, brainstorming and I stayed at Duke and took it. And he when when he left and, and went elsewhere, he took it with him and we stayed in contact since then. Um, Ryan is like Sheldon there. You, you've been a track coach before. There are very few people you would trust uh, your athletes to. You say, okay, this is the result I want from your weight training program here. You take them and do them. Um, Sheldon and Ryan are two that I've just given an athlete to and say, this is what I want from him and you do it. So, um, I still stay in contact with Ryan. I mean, basically he was, that's where it came from. Just brainstorming with him. Got it. Yeah. You know, it's funny. Cause I, I was kind of thinking, you know, Jeff, when we were talking on our last podcast, you know, you were talking about, all right, well in the, the seventies, like everyone coached sprinting like this. And then in the eighties, some more, you know, everyone was, or nineties or whenever people started talking more about front side and not just pushing backwards as hard as you can. Uh, and so I was thinking about, you know, through the decades, well, maybe, you know, there was some Russian offshoot in the eighties and you picked it up a long time ago. I'm sure there probably were people doing that kind of stuff, but it, it does make me think, you know, now that you say that and you mentioned it in conjunction with Cal Dietz, um, it does make me think that at least it is a little bit of a younger, uh, you know, I, I always say there's nothing new under the sun, or at least I, I think that a lot, like how much is really, truly new. But I do think that this um, iteration of training is a little bit newer than, at least in the commonplace usage, than a lot of other modalities. So in many ways, I think we're we're still learning with it. And so, again, the reason I'm excited to talk with you guys about it today as well. Well, it's, I, it's probably within the last 30 years for sure. Um, I've seen a little bit of stuff, you know, just doing some research on it. Basically, uh, Steve Javoric, Iston Javoric, however you want to pronounce his name, uh, doing some of the wave stuff. Um, basically, has some history in that in that same area. And I've taken some of the oscillations and actually modified them some to to fit some of the things that uh, Javoric or Javoric does. But um, it has its basis, I think, in in some some of the European training of probably in the mid to late seventies, and then it's just kind of kind of morphed since that point in time. Yeah. So before we get too much further as well, um, I think that a part of oscillating that just the term is self-explanatory and, you know, Sheldon, I know you were talking about you know, your specific usage of it last time you were on the show, but uh, just give me a brief overview of, and, and I'm sure there's probably plenty of ways, but just some, um, maybe a, a what oscillatory reps are in terms of how you use them. Uh, and then maybe some different styles of the movement, like um, like a few oscillations plus a lift or what it looks like on a barbell squat. If you guys just want to, you know, however you like, um, describe the method and some of the key or primary ways that you actually use it mechanically. Um, I guess I'll, I'll start off with it. Whenever I am coaching it, especially, uh, I like to use it towards, especially like, uh, let's, for example, use the, uh, the back squat or really any kind of squat you can do this with. It's, okay, we're starting at the top. You get down to wherever our, wherever your in range of motion is, and from there it's kind of a, a continuous bounce through that in range, and then coming back up at the top. Um, it could be like you you come down, you hit your first one down like you would a normal squat. If you come back down a second time, then technically that's already you're already oscillating. So it could be a one and a half rep. Um, or I or a two bounce method of doing it, so two to three to four to five, however many, or even for a period of time, however long you want to be down there and bouncing and then coming out of the top. Um, I think in physics, if you look at like a spring oscillating, it's it's just something moving up and down in a rhythmic motion. Um, and so I, I guess it's kind of usually how I describe using it. Um, or if you're looking at uh, whenever I was doing it with my, if you if you think about a one and a half, I would explain it to my athletes at UC Davis this way. If I'm looking at that bar, uh, how that bar is traveling over time, it should look like a W. Like it should go down, back up a little bit, back down, then right back up, and then just kind of replicate that amplitude or that wave over and over if need be. Yeah, Jeff, you had said you had experimented with a lot of different types of the uh, oscillating method. Is there any 
any specific uh, prescriptions like one bounce, two bounce, three bounce, uh, or just continual bounces? Is there anything that you really landed on more so uh, throughout your time working with that method? Um, well, a lot depends on the depth, uh, how, you know, how deep you are and, and the weight, obviously. Um, Sheldon, the W description was, it was absolutely perfect. You can't get any better than that. Everybody can see that. It's a bit, it's a visual cue, which is, which is wonderful. Um, the main thing for me in, in teaching it is, uh, controlling the distance of the oscillation and, and controlling the speed of the oscillation. Usually when I did it, usually, um, uh, the, the oscillation distances were six to nine inches. Basically, the, you'd go to the bottom and basically bounce out six to nine inches, depending on the weight and depending on how deep you were. Um, one of the things that we try to emphasize with the athletes is it's not a controlled descent. It is basically when you get to the bottom, you, you push your body up again, and it's a free fall back down to the bottom, eight or nine inches and bounce out. Um, it allows you to, to do them a little much, much quicker. Um, so to try to just you know, create as much time under tension as you can you can take a lighter weight and make it act like a heavier weight mm. uh by by giving you know putting people in time under tension type activities um the um it was not always the same depth uh we i would do sets and reps um some at the same depth all the time with the same amount of oscillations uh sometimes we would go in a, de in a descending order in regard to how deep it was, shallow, medium, sh like shallow, half squat, deep. Sometimes we would go, you know, full squat, half squat, shallow. Um, sometimes we would go shallow, deep, shallow, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. If we're ever doing basically three sets, try to keep my sets and reps. Basically, I stay primarily with three bounces in the bottom. I've gone as far as five. You do a five a five bounce bottom and you're in a deep squat, there's a good chance you're going to get stuck down there. <laughs> uh, um, it's a long time to basically hold it. It is dynamic time under tension, but you're, you got a lot of tension and it's eccentric loading in the bottom of that squat too. So it basically, it's got a lot of nervous system uh, activity going on. It'll take a pretty big toll in the athlete. Um, usually did uh, three reps to four reps within a set. And anywhere from three to five, uh, three, I mean, excuse me, uh, three to four sets of three to five reps per set, basically what I did with that. And each squat, and it was primarily uh, lower body work. If I were doing squats, each squat would have three bounces in it. So you did as many as, as you know, three reps with three bounces as non basic squats uh, in the bottom. Um, and uh, used a lot of variation regarding to depth. Um, I found that the, uh, the deeper you get, if you're doing full squats, the oscillations need to be a little bit bigger. Uh, it's very hard to stay down in a really small, really small oscillation as, as you, you know, deep enough full squat. Um, as you go up to half squats and shallow squats, you can make them shorter and much, much quicker, more elastic in nature. Yeah. It seems like, yeah. And in, in my own experience that the back squat is definitely the hardest to hit repeated good oscillations especially with a heavier weight it's like that lever arm just does wear you out pretty quick versus doing something that's more like a bench press or something like that uh, you know i was going to ask as well with uh you know sheldon you had mentioned back when you were talking the first time about it how you integrated the method how it was having a really ben a strong benefit on power output and especially like stride length on the runway for jumpers things like that Mm -hmm. um, Jeff, you had mentioned a little bit about the strength piece uh, and, and the time under tension piece. And I will say um, with the uh, oscillating squats, and, and I found them to be really beneficial um, as well um, in learning from, especially after that first episode we had done, Sheldon. Uh, but Jeff, you had mentioned strength. And I, was, and I know you had mentioned an anecdote as well of an athlete, Jeff. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but it, it was when we were talking after the first show we did. And it was just an athlete who I think all you had him doing was oscillating, squatting or something like that. And his squat max just like took off. And, and I'm sure he got his jump improved too. But when you do that type of work, you feel like, like the muscular tension for the brief moment where you are doing the bounce is extremely high. Um, versus I think that if you just do straight up and down reps, you could go through, um, maybe not quite as high a muscular tension, but it's more prolonged. So it's almost like you're, you're punching tension in these little hits in the sticking point. 
And so I, I'm curious, uh, I know we've talked about the power aspect of it, but I'm curious, you know, like Jeff, you had said with the strength end as well, if you have any anecdotes or, or thoughts on uh, the strength uh, benefits of doing an oscillating type method versus uh, just straight reps or, or like a velocity based, just, Hey, let's put the bar on and just, you know, jam it and just go up and down without bouncing. Um, this just general strength levels, you know, they basically do increase logarithmically. Um, I had the athlete that we were speaking of was uh, a kid that I trained. Uh, he went to he went to West Point on a baseball scholarship, and he's playing right now in the uh, Detroit Tigers Double uh, A system. Um, but basically, um, I tested him initially. Did, I've trained him for about six years, and for the first two years, we didn't do a lot of weight training because he was pretty young. And then we. Um, Came in the weight room one day and I was going to start, you know, putting him on some some general, you know, a, a full collegiate type of training program. So uh, we were allowed to bring some athletes in after after hours when there weren't any other athletes, uh, our athletes there. So he came in one day and we did a squat test with him. He was 5'9", he weighed 155. So I basically just gave him a rep test. I wanted to see basically what he looked like. I put 135 on his back and uh, uh, let him squat to a, to a bench, a bench press bench. And he squat. He did it 13 times, and then he was pretty tired, and so, so he, he stopped. So we trained the rest of the time in different uh, different types of modes. We did some jump squats and some uh, oscillation squats, but never used more than 115 pounds. And um, in basically two months, he did. He went from uh, 13 times 135 to 34 times 165. <laughs> so it's 34. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. And I had um, one of the strength coaches that was uh, was at Duke at the time was actually witnessed it, and he said, "I've never seen anything like that." Really. We, um, um, later on, two and a half months later, I, I asked uh, one of our athletic trainers to come in and watch him. He, they were still hanging around after after practice one day. Some of squat testers could. I would like for you to take a look at him. I mean, just be here in case you get sent in any distress. I'm not sure how long he's going to do this. So I did the same test. We did 165 as many times as he could, and he did 64 times. Um, so he went from 13 times 135 to 34 times 165 to 64 times 165. And um, I asked, I said, he was still moving the bar pretty well. And I said, uh, you okay? Did you get hurt? You feel sick? He said, no, I'm just getting bored. <laughs> So, um, just incredible muscular endurance. Um, his, uh, we never fully tested him in a one rep max, but his standing long jump increased, uh, 11 inches. Uh, and he was a pretty good jumper anyway. Um, his vertical went up four. Um, and he was, he, he, he was a pretty elastic kid. He's, uh, one of the more elastic athletes I've ever coached. But uh, from a general strength standpoint, it, um, I've used it in the weight room with my teams uh, extensively, and they all get much, much stronger. The thing I see as much as anything is their ability to decelerate. Basically, you know, linear deceleration, uh, you know, handle landings from jumps, they, they decelerate very, very well. Yeah, when you... Um, oh, yeah, go ahead, Sheldon. I was just wanting to say, like, for one, like that, it's super interesting to me, especially where i'm at where i'm working at because like i haven't actually where i'm at now i rarely actually use oscillating a lot of our guys just need reps yeah um but hearing that um you went from 13 at 135 to 30 something at 165 to 64 at 165 in a in working in a population where repetitive movement over and over and over and over and over again is is money in the bank that makes it it's it makes it a lot more enticing as versus um my my strength endeavors with it with this back in february when i did my presentation at duke i did it i did a uh, did it on oscillating or integrating oscillatory training and um in preparation for that in preparation for that uh that talk um i went through different protocols and whatnot for it and but i was just going off for just pure pure strength pure one rep max strength um 
And in about seven weeks, I went from 365 to 410 on uh, 1RM. Um, and that's cool, especially if you're like for ego lifting. But when it comes to like actual applicable methods for a military population, like where I'm working with now, that's probably a lot better that someone can do 64 reps at 165 than one rep at 410. Um, so they just got my brain thinking about that, sitting here listening and talking about mm-hmm. like different ways that I can play around with it with my guys. Yeah, and I was going to... I. I... I'll put that on pause, Sheldon, because I did want to ask you about um, it more on the strength end of things as well. With the, I know in the presentation you did, you had talked about the powerlifting aspects of it. Um, I, let me ask you guys this, though, before we circle back to that one. Is uh, just like integration in the sense of, um, like Jeff, you had said you were using it with like really lighter weights with this individual. And uh, like you had said, he hadn't um, done much or any lifting initially the first couple of years you worked with him. Um, but so I, anyways, I was thinking about, well, how do you, uh, bringing this in for novices versus more advanced individuals? And maybe I'll, I'll also add on the possible layer, if you guys want to touch on it, is bringing it in throughout and progressing it through the training year. I, I believe, um, Jeff, you had mentioned Cal Dietz and I, from my memory, Cal had some sort of, it was like an oscillatory, I don't think it was heavy. I think it was all like really lightweight stuff, but basically it was like a, like a base phase that was based off more oscillatory movements. Uh, I think Jay Schrader has a lot of kind of similar stuff uh, within his system, like especially like the isometric, or even in that the old Inno Sport um, group that was kind of synonymous with a lot of Jay's methods. There was a lot of isometric holds and kind of quick bounce outs that were in that system. And so, uh, you know, my thought is, especially maybe like a military population, maybe you don't go heavy with it, um, but you do a lot of the more body weight, lighter weight, bounce base just to get the nervous system in that mode. But then you have a power lifter and you can also use it with power lifting. Uh, sorry, my, 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 my wheels are just kind of turning off of that. But I, anyway, sorry, I'm, I, I want to, I'll take it back to the question. So basically throughout the training year, how do you bring it in uh, or what's your thought process for a novice uh, individual integrating it versus someone who's more experienced and how you're introducing the method? Is that for me? Uh, either. Uh, let's, yeah, either. either Chill and you got it. Um, when I first did it, when I was at UC Davis um, with my track team, like I said, I integrated it in with um, with triphasic. So once I was comfortable and knew that they knew how to, that they were comfortable moving that way, and we were actually going fairly heavy. Um, we were going fairly heavy in their 1RM percentages for oscillating for, and when we were doing it, um, and we, we did our we did our weeks of eccentrics, and that gave me as a coach comfort and like, hey, you've now moved this weight, and you've controlled this weight. Now let's let's give it, let's take it up a step. Um, and then, but listening, even now listening to Hauser talk about this, like as you said earlier, you want to he he coaches his athletes to be able to fall into it and turn it back on. Um, I wasn't necessarily teaching them to fall. I was just more so it was kind of a turn on and turn, turn it off and turn it back on. But it, I feel like it wasn't necessarily like I, I didn't come of it, didn't look at it in that aspect of completely turn it off, turn it right back on. It was control that bounce down, control that fall down, and then speed up out of that little bit as much as you can just for that little burst. Uh, but as far as integrating it in with the a novice athlete like looking back at it now if i had someone who's like really young in training age it would be more so looking at it with um with uh i guess i I would regress it like i would if someone could like if someone couldn't front squat um i would regress them back down to a goblet squat so same kind of thing with this like we could do a goblet oscillating squat and kind of lessen the weight but still get them the concept of the movement and how to and then once they got the concept down pat then we start i mean their training gauge their coordination all the nervous system all those things are firing better now and we're able to kind of move up and move up into more uh difficult oscillating i guess like a like a different level of oscillating um or just straight body weight of 
um, like a split squat. So we're going to oscillate at the bottom of a split squat, or we're going to oscillate at a quarter of the way down of a split squat. If we're working with like maybe like a younger track athlete, and I'm trying to get them to learn what it is to put force into the ground at certain angles. Um, because one of the things I think about oscillating is if you only hit that, you only, if you got a set of five and you only hit that bottom five times, well, now we could double that, we can triple that in that set, and you're now getting 15 reps at that spot. Um, and we're able to, to, you're able to learn what it feels like more to be at that spot in that position and move through that. This is off the top of my head, this kind of, um, spitballing looking at it. Um, one of the things is that for I found is for novices uh, at any age uh, is the safety factor involved. You can take a lighter weight and make it act heavier. Um, they're they're not as scared of it. You can actually get them in positions and that, that they probably would not achieve with a heavier weight. Um, and the dynamic time under tension, you know. You're doing a couple of things. You're turning on, turning muscles on and off very quickly. Um, you're activating the nervous system. You're training a lot of connective tissue. You got some fascia training in there. You got you got a, you got a bunch of connective tissue training by virtue of the fact that you're bouncing up and down. And like when I trained the kid that, that did all of the squats, uh, he basically trained with 115 pounds. That was basically what what he did the entire time. He was able to do that many reps with that with 165. Um, I found a lot. It, the difficulty is in training at any population is in training the distance of the oscillation. Most uh, most athletes or clients uh, want to oscillate in larger ranges of motion, and they want they want to control it as a slow descent. The value that I have seen in it is basically in shorter oscillations and let it once you once you lift it out of the bottom again, you let it free fall back to the bottom and reverse it very very quickly. Um, in brief period, just jamming the force time curve way to the left. So um, that's just kind of my perspective on it there. Um, I have been able to do, I actually do it uh, with some shuttles, and I've got a few of the older population people that I train. They do a pretty good job of it, or a job with it. Um, I have found that a slightly wider stance works well for oscillations than the sort of narrower squat stance. Um, basically something like a Mark Ripito type of, of stance in there. Um, but um, from a safety factor and from a, a, an introduction factor, they're, they're, most people I have trained are more willing to put that lighter weight on their back, go down and stay there a little while and bounce and come up. Once they, once they get the timing and basically understand what the posture is and how to, how to maintain the posture in the bottom, it's been very, very easy to train it. Got it. So, um, oh, go ahead, Sean. Oh. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, well, so one of the things that um, that we have in common, I guess we just kind of went in at a different way, was uh, being able to have that control slash comfort factor with the athlete to let them know that they can still move this weight. Um, Jeff went through it with using a lighter weight, and I went through it by having them do an eccentric phase for us to know that they could control the weight. Um, and that same kind of thing, like it got them comfort. It broke down whatever barrier may have been in their head. Because if I just would have came in when in the weight room one day and be like, "All right, here's what we're doing. We're gonna get to the bottom of this squat and we're just gonna bounce," I'm sure they would be like, "Uh, uh-uh, I'm not doing that, Coach Sheldon. You can go somewhere else with that." Um, and so, it, that it, it establishing that and kind of giving them the the confidence that they can that they can move with that um move with the weight and then a, a, i have a question for you hauser because i don't know, sorry i'm taking over some oh yeah uh, that's okay question yeah, asking. please do <laughs> please do um so with your athlete that you did with just he just had 115 for however however long that he did that what did you do did you keep him did you end up uh giving him more bounces in the bottom did you end up giving him more uh, did he build up volume i guess uh, through that that time of him, however long that that time was, like, um, did he end up getting more sets? Did he end up getting more reps? I'm sure. I'm assuming that he got more sets and reps. Did he just? That I know you said you typically stick with about three bounces at the bottom. Um, but like, can you 
can you give a little bit of peek behind the curtain of what that was like uh, yeah. developing that? Um, all the above, basically. He um, he had uh, he, he went to five bounces in the bottom. Uh, eventually, we added reps and we added sets, so he increased his volume, basically, but what it what it was. Um, don't get me wrong. I don't do nothing. I don't do anything. You know, I do more than just shallow or, or light weights. Right. And right. I do, depending on the athlete and depending on the depth of the of the oscillation. I do some very very heavy weights with some of them, just like you do with with your yeah. players out there. Um, got some great results doing partials, basically half squats and and, and quarters uh, oscillations. With real, real heavy weight for high jumpers, basically just being able to block when they come in off, off planting and blocking and coming off the off the off the J. Um, um, uh, one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking earlier, I do remember when being in the weight room with with one of the teams, and you you do giving them all right. We're gonna do a we're gonna do a half squat, full squat, half squat, and it never really had dawned on me that that's still I feel like there's still a form of oscillating, whether or not I, it's just, I don't know, it just, it's just kind of like clicking in my head or just things that I've just forgotten over the years and now remember, because I do remember you seeing and having them do different depths of oscillating or, or hitting different depths of whatever they're doing in the same set. Like, well, in this same set, we're going to half squat. Well, this one rep, excuse me, this one rep is going to be a half squat. Uh, a full depth squat and then another half squat and then pop out the bottom of that. Um, and it's just things that I forgot about now remembering. Um, so are those some that of the was that kind you, of, Go ahead. Well, I'm saying is that some of the things that you did as well um, with this athlete? Um, I, do, I, have, I did not do it with that particular athlete I was speaking about. But I have done it with other athletes, basically moving into um, making the oscillations of of different depths. Basically, if we do a shallow or a deep, and, and basically you move as far as 15 inches sometimes, and then go back down to six, depending on what you're doing, depending on the weight, depending on the depth of the squat. Um, that was sort of when we were started moving to taking and uh, combining oscillations with uh, Javorix or Yavorix type of wave type squats where we do initially three or four oscillations and then go to a shallow jump and deep jump uh, within each set. So there we go. Uh, they hit the bottom five times and hit the bottom one, two, and three. You would do an oscillation. Uh, after you hit it the third time, you'd come out fast and do a shallow jump and land, and then you do jump high again and then and have a deep landing and come out of it. So basically they were moving – all the way through different ranges of motion with different uh, ballistic profiles to each individual, uh, each individual rep. I wanted to take a quick break from the show and share about the difference that performance herbalism can make for you. Several years back, I had strongman mental training expert and herbalist Logan Christopher on the show, and the show was about uh, mental training originally. And after the episode, I realized that Logan had an herbalism company. I had no idea really much about herbalism, uh, but I ended up ordering the Phoenix formula. Uh, I ended up getting great results, increased energy. I far decreased my need for caffeine. And a couple of weeks after taking the Phoenix formula, I actually noticed that my weight room numbers were going up, which I really hadn't expected when I first used the product. And shortly thereafter, I got into Shiliajit resin, which is also in the Phoenix formula and is popular with strength coaches. Uh, pine pollen tincture, some of the mushroom tinctures that they have. And I really believe in what Logan and Lost Empire Herbs are doing in creating and facilitating a natural approach uh, to performance supplementation. If you want to check out the herbs that I use personally at Lost Empire, you can head to lostempireherbs.com slash justfly. And there you can also grab 15% off your order. If you use the code justfly at checkout as well, that'll also get you that 15% off. They have a 365-day money-back guarantee. And I'm really happy that they're sponsors of the show. So hope you get a chance to check them out. Uh, let's get back to the episode. With you, uh, with how you guys were actually coaching those, it was uh, interesting because it sounded like, Jeff, your general, I, it, you know, obviously you had done many different iterations of the oscillating, but it sounds like your style is a little bit more 
um, like like tighter oscillations, like like you said, make a lightweight feel heavy. And Sheldon, you had talked about like owning the weight first, going through the eccentric phase, and I'm assuming they were probably a little bit a uh, little bit on the heavier end of things for the oscillating reps. But it, were they being a little bit more smooth with the bounces, like were you just coaching them to oscillate? But maybe it's kind of whatever rhythm felt comfortable, and and then you know get out of it quickly. Uh, just digging into that a little bit more, because obviously. You got great results, Sheldon, with those jumpers. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, and I, I think with anything, there's certainly more than one way to do it. But I think it's also interesting. Well, one just to have some variety, but then also have a reason behind um, the specific iteration that you're doing. So yeah, I'm just curious with um, maybe to get a little bit more into some of that uh, in terms of how you actually coach and how the reps end up getting executed. Yeah, I um actually tried to have them. Like my coaching instructions where I want you to get to the bottom and I want it to be like quick, three quick hard bounces out the bottom. And I was still drawing back from what I knew when I learned from Hauser, which was okay. more of that quick bounces and speed. But with the weight I was using, um, I, I coached with that being the intent. And I guess with me giving them that intent in that direction, they tried and, and to get as fast as they could. But it always ended up Got it. smoother, slower. Like the weight is going to dictate no matter no matter what it is. So as fast as I want to go, that weight is only going to is only going to allow me to go so fast. But what is behind that is that intent to move it fast. Um, and that's one of the things that I ended up playing around with. Um, that I ended up playing around with when I ended up doing all my stuff for the presentation at Duke was still having that intent behind it um, and that's why i ended up attaching nintendo to it so i could keep track of my velocities coming out um but that was always my intent when i was coaching them that hey i want you to move this out of the bottom as fast as you can i don't care if it's heavy this is still our intent and they they stuck with it um again like i said it just it ended up being a smoother a little bit bigger of a bounce that i wanted that i that i had initially seen from hauser and that's what I went in my mind. That's what I had. It's just not what I got. And I just kept trying to like, well, oh, we'll see how this goes. And it ended up working well for me. Um, but that's just, it wasn't anything that I had seen at that time. Cause all I'd seen at that time was Hauser at that time, I guess with the teams that we had Hauser's oscillations were more of that quick, poppy, bouncy, snappy, um, oscillating, not the, smoother uh bigger oscillations gotcha uh, do you fa- uh do you guys feel like you could watch an athlete or or across a spectrum of athletes um like learn about the athlete by watching how they oscillate their skill of the oscillations and those types of things relative to the winner at max I, is there is that something that you feel can also be almost its own little diagnostic if that makes sense it definitely takes me like I could definitely see someone who's coordinated and who's not um, like they'll get to the or if they're, if they're not really clicking of what I'm saying, they'll get to the bottom, pause, come halfway up, pause, mm-hmm. go back down, pause instead <laughs> of letting it be smooth. And some. I don't know, it's like the, it's like someone watching someone trying to do uh, the cha cha real horribly. <laughs> it just looks kind of painful. Um, and. Uh, I, you can definitely see that and like, okay, this might not be your thing, but we may be able to, we can, we can make it your thing. We can, we can fix that. We can massage that a little bit more. Um, and that's how I, I kind of look at it whenever I'm watching someone oscillate. I agree with that. I, I, there are certain athletes that really have a tough time with it. They have a tough time turning the nervous system on and off that quickly, particularly when they're under tension. Um, but they, it's it, most athletes learn to do it better. Not all are great, but they always tend to be, you know, get better as they go along with it. So they do improve. Yeah. Do you guys, um, do you guys feel like, uh, there's any athletes who are better candidates for the method than others? I mean, Jeff, you had mentioned that athlete who had that huge breakthrough. Like if he was already an elastic type person, do you feel that athletes who are more elastic types, um, on this show, we've, done um we've done talks on rib cage angle like a narrow infrastructural angle is like a more elastic athlete type individual do you feel like there's certain 
types of athletes that might respond better uh, to oscillating training just in general? Or uh, are there possibly athletes who might do better with a heavier weight versus a lighter weight possibly or any different um, individualization factors when we're talking about this? I think a lot depends on what you're trying to what you're trying to train. Um, I have um, I've seen uh, uh, slow twitch, uh, less elastic athletes get pretty elastic doing it. Um, they basically get get much quicker and uh, and much bouncier. They you, they they tighten the trampoline much much tighter, so they tend to get. It helps them get off the ground. It helps them de- decelerate. Um, I think I've probably seen greater improvements in less elastic athletes than I have in elastic athletes, but they all do improve. Yeah, I could definitely co-sign on that Um, because I had my throwers oscillate when I was at UC Davis. Uh, um, And again, they were moving weight a lot more fast. So I definitely I definitely think any kind of athlete can do it. And it's going to be I I don't know about water, like a water polo player, but um but i definitely do think that like whether you're lifting it's just going to really depend on the weight that you're lifting how much it is versus your sport because i i think uh i think a triple jumper could do it like a like a just as well as a um as a power lifting like squat champion could benefit from it i think they both could uh it, it's just again like you said it's going to depend on that weight and like the one of the things that Hauser said that really, really like hits home is it's tightening that trampoline. Mm-hmm. It's shortening that amortization phase, that that V or closing the gap on that V of the of the um eccentric phase and the concentric phase, tightening that thing up, and that's just gonna produce dividends for really anything that you're doing. Do you guys have any thoughts on um, cause I, before I knew much about the oscillating reps, I remember, I think this was, uh, mentioned in Ted Starzynski's book, uh, explosive plyometric training or something like that for all sports. And he talked about just timing squats. So maybe this is like the eighties, you know, the version of it where it, like, if you just said, Hey, we're just going to time half squats or something like that. And we're not necessarily oscillating, but Hey, do these eight half squats as fast as you possibly can. And that um, I, I think that it wasn't just uh, Starzynski, but I think other coaches I'd heard writing about the effectiveness of just doing that. So it's that also, it's not really hitting the sticking point or the critical point to lift so much, but it is just going as fast as possible. Um, just in my own mind, it, you know, Sheldon, I like what you said. It's like, you know, it's like we're combining something that's intense with some dance aspects, <laughs> some rhythm aspects. <laughs> so it's still an intense training stimulus. But it, you know, I'm just curious. Um, I'm, I, where I would, I would think that like just doing speed squats doesn't require as much dancing ability. <laughs> uh, but that, that's my take with that. But I'm curious if you guys ever just do like just time sets, uh, speed squats that isn't in that oscillating in the critical position so much. Uh, just lifts like, hey, do these five squats for speed or anything like that, or do you just is most of it really in the oscillating uh, version? Uh, I haven't done anything like that. Um, I haven't really messed with time with uh, with oscillating. Um, but what I mean, what that it still sounds like it's describing oscillating. Whether it's just you're doing a top end top end of a squat and you're doing a bigger oscillation. Um, I mean, it's all still sounds yeah, like still oscillating. Yeah. Like it's still precursor. oscillating. Yeah, just just a big, much, much bigger oscillation, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, but I mean, if you're doing it as fast as you can, you're going to still be loading that stretch shortening cycle for for that time, for whatever, whatever that time frame is for those reps. Um, so it definitely sounds intriguing uh, to be able to, or it's, it's interesting to hear it thought of in that capacity because I haven't heard that before. Um, but yeah, I haven't messed. I haven't done it with time. I I know I've heard Cal Dietz say like he'll do it with. Uh, he'll put athletes on a stopwatch and gonna oscillate for five seconds or whatever for a set or for a rep. Um, but yeah, I've done a little bit of that. Um, I've done uh, things like taking eighty percent, eighty five percent, and doing uh, three to four reps as fast as you possibly can. Um, to a certain depth. Uh, the main thing I found with that is in the bottom 
but they're trying to speed up so much that 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 they're just free falling totally to the bottom and they're having yeah. trouble controlling it if they go too deep. So we we got better results going in the half squat range, um, maybe a little deeper than that, and just moving as fast as we could with, with those percentages. Um, it's moving toward what Javorek does uh, in with his wave squats, and basically, you know. It's a it's an amp it's a oscillation with a you know full range oscillation is what it basically is. Amplitude is much much bigger, um, so it, it looks a lot like Javorix type stuff. Got it. I would think with that that um what, what makes it kind of interesting to think about is well even like you said they're not necessarily able to control that weight. It's like if you're going all the way back up to the top every time that's a long way to try to slow that like that bar is gaining so much momentum and speed on the way back down that you're having to stop that versus getting to that point and bouncing through having a smaller bounce to that point gives you a lot more it gives you a greater ability to have more control over that that bar or whatever you're oscillating with than trying to start from your standing position and dropping down into that it just kind of seems seems a bit spicy to me <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think they, they both can work, but it, it is interesting. And I asked that partially because I have gravitated in the last um, 10 years from initially, again, like before I learned about the oscillatory reps uh, type things, I would often use the speed squats and the athletes liked it. And I feel like it was, we got good results with it, but I do feel like there's just something that's a little, that's just a little more finesse to, to the oscillating portion, especially once you work the waves in there, you know, it's like two plus one, three plus one. I think there's just something with the coordination in that. Um, I think that's really effective. And then I also think too, when you don't have the big free fall, you almost have to generate more downward speed and generate more upward speed more intentionally, where if you have that bigger free fall, it, you can kind of cheat it and wiggle it a few different ways. And that's kind of hard to describe, but um, I've always actually felt like the oscillating is, is almost more intense, if that makes sense. Um, so, but yeah, I was just curious with you guys. I, I would still do speed squat stuff too, but I just haven't, I've just done all oscillate, oscillating. I just feel like it's easier too. honestly, it's you, you less range of motion. It's like the, you can like plug all that intensity into that smaller range. I, I will say that when I was dabbling some, uh before my presentation at duke it um i i wanted to do uh oscillating at the bottom and then oscillating halfway up like oscillating at like a half squat range um and i ended up reverting to drop squats like a half drop squat which is i mean but i i was doing that with a lighter weight so standing up literally dropped my feet out from under me catch it at half at half depth and then exploding back out of that as fast as I can. It wasn't as heavy as I would as I was oscillating, but I guess I probably could have did a heavier half rep oscillating um as opposed to doing the drop spots. It, just, it didn't feel as I didn't feel like I was getting as much out of it when I was doing the half oscillating squats as when I did the drop squat. But maybe I just wasn't going heavy enough. Yeah, I know uh, Brady Volmering a few episodes back was talking about how he started exclusively himself after a console with Jay Schrader doing uh, drop squat and drop bench. So basically bench, hold the bar at arm's length, drop it, catch it an inch off your chest, lift it back up, and then squat, basically same deal, um, I think to just about full depth for that, or maybe it was full depth, and his bench press just numbers exploded, like in a similar manner to what you know, Jeff, what you were talking about with that athlete and then squat numbers went up a lot as well. And so I think that, you know, just that like, and just the tensioning in, in either of those styles, oscillatory or drop catch is just so high. Um, mm. And I think there's a lot of potential with either of them. And back, uh, something that you said very early on, Jeff, you know, it's, it is, it is costly in the nervous system though. And, and uh, I mean, of course, everything, lots of things are costly on the nervous system. So it's not like, um, you know, it's like you have to be, I think, so like insanely strategic and, and only use it like two weeks out of the year or something like that. But um, I, I would, my question is, what do you guys think about like just doing normal lifting and letting plyometrics take care of that, that element? If you, if, for example, just doing like a bunch of low squat foot jumps and then an explosive jump upwards or uh, different single leg uh, plyometric iterations or lunge jump, iter all those things that also have that 
that stretch shortening component. Uh, thoughts on, I guess, just juggling those things, like juggling those elements, like a program that was just regular lifting and plyos, a program that's uh, oscillating and play your sport. Or I guess, how do we, you think about mixing those ingredients together? Because I know there's so many ways to get those impulses. Uh, do you guys have any take on on mixing these things together in a program when there's different possibilities involved, like plyometrics included, heavier lifting, kids playing their sports? Uh, how do we balance uh, or integrate the oscillating stuff in light of that? You want to show? Um, uh, yeah, I can. I guess a little speak on it. Um, when it comes to, I guess, like oscillating versus plyometrics. Um, I look at oscillating as a closed plyometric, yeah. like a closed chain plyometric. And so, like, when you're doing box jumps or death drops and or, or like those bounds or the quick foot stuff, I think a lot of that um, gets absorbed up through the Achilles and your calves, and it doesn't really go up the chain much, at least, like it's, mm-hmm. at least my experiences of it, and not really traveling as far as the train is, uh, uh, up the chain to, like, your hamstrings and your glutes. Whereas oscillating in the squat or or whatever whatever those things are, where it could be like a split squat or something of that nature, um, that kind of makes the 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 stress shortening cycle really like the the shock absorbing of the plyometric of it coming come up to your glutes and your hamstrings by keeping that chain, keeping the, the really the feet out of it and letting that letting that come through your go through your glutes, go through your hamstrings. Um, and I think, honestly, thinking about it on like a perspective, if you're looking at a week of training, maybe Monday we do oscillating squats. Wednesday we could do the the plyometrics of like the, the quick feet work and all that stuff. And then maybe Friday we hit like the heavy squats, um, the heavy regular lifting. Um, and you're able to get all of that potentially in a week. Uh, keeping those higher taxing things. I mean, maybe you could even, maybe you could flip flop and do uh, regular squats on a Wednesday and do the plyometrics for uh, the plyometrics on Friday. So you're getting those a little bit further away from each other. Um, and you have two days to recover, your nervous system to recover in between that. Um, I, I, obviously there's no wrong way of, of doing it. At least we haven't found the wrong way yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's kind of what I thought. Uh, my thoughts on it are, uh, especially oscillating in general, being that closed chain plyometric for specifically glutes or hamstrings, as opposed to letting the Achilles and the, the calves and the, all the everything in there uh, absorb that force and all the foot strength absorb that force. Uh, one of the things that I found is that if you do oscillation squats early, your plyometric plyometric activities will be much better later on. Um, it's amazing. Like you talk about stretch shortening cycle, basically the amortization time at the bottom. Mm-hmm. Um, the, just it's the ability just to, to block when you jump greatly enhanced if you do a, a fair amount of oscillation work first. Like you mentioned, Sheldon, drop squats in it. Basically, my more advanced athletes, I have gone. Um, uh, basically dropped in, into a drop drop squat into oscillations and then jump out of the of the drop squat. Um, they get to that point, basically they're pretty elastic. Um, starting acceleration is greatly enhanced when you do stuff like that. Um, we actually trained, uh, tested some acceleration stuff without actually doing any acceleration run work. After three weeks of drop squats into, into uh, oscillations and back out, and every athlete I had improved uh, in a in a twenty meter acceleration. I had some athletes improved two and a half tenths. All of them improved basically five hundredths to point uh, one five. That's awesome. Yeah, I I believe that with the oscillating squat type work, I've I've had similar anecdotes myself. And just because it's like that, those leg angles, that explosive isometric strength at those early angles and acceleration, it's, it's so similar. And then it's also just such a novel, high intensity way of loading it. And, and Sheldon, like you said, I, I do think there's athletes who like when they do plyometrics, they are so spring loaded through the feet. And I am one of them <laughs> that you can very easily. And yeah, you train the, you know, hips and hamstrings and quads and stuff, but it, 
you do so much, you get so much output out of the fascial piece, the feet, that it, you can leave that area a little bit under trained compared to um, the stimulus you could get in the gym. And I feel that every time I do oscillating squats, I'm like, nope, not training my legs like this when I'm doing plyos. I mean, there's some plyos like, like single leg, more deep range that I can get pretty close. Um, but that, yeah, that oscillating squat is, is a powerful one. One of the things I've found is, is that the plyos that actually improved for my group better were not the counter move plyos, but they were the, basically just the, um, the, um, the, the landing and reversal, anything that re- required a counter move did not improve a ton, but anything where you actually had to basically land and, and respond were greatly enhanced. Gotcha. Can you describe that again? So you said counter move, the counter like a like a like a regular vertical jump versus yeah, right, like a right, like, like a, a depth jump, jump, like a de- jump like a depth jump. Is that what you're saying, or is that something or something different? I'm sorry, just trying to understand. Well, uh, they they were spun off a depth jump, but I, like a counter move jump, basically, which is straight vertical jump. Basically, yeah. I'm taking a longer time to get into the bottom, and, and I'm not utilizing a, a real yeah. short stretch shortening cycle to basically accelerate upward. Gotcha. Gotcha. So basically just stuff that's involving gravity and then just really tries to make that turnaround time that uses gravity and tries to make that turnaround time faster yeah. versus more reactive in nature, more reactive plyo than it is counter move plyo. Got it. It's kind of like a, um, using your stretch sorting cycle versus rate of force development. Yep, that's right. what I'm, what I'm gathering. Yep. Awesome. Well, good stuff. Um, you know, Sheldon, I'll just finish this out with just maybe just a couple of things is one is I just had a thought come up and you know, I, I, maybe this is just the thought that I had. I'm trying to figure out where I'd go with the question, but just in, in listening to you guys talk and then, you know, back to the anecdote at the beginning where Jeff, you were talking about not using more than 115. I just had my wheels turning. I was thinking about, <laughs> I, I don't think he's the strength coach there anymore, but it was uh, one of the strength coaches that the University of Nebraska had. I think one of his things was, we only lift 45s and 25s or something, you know, that we don't, he got rid of all the 10s and 5s in the weight room or something. <laughs> and I was thinking, I think, you know, and Dan John had mentioned something like that too, but more for the sake of like being resourceful. And so I was thinking, well, what if you only, what if you were in that situation? So if you got to make the jump from, you know, 185 to, you know, 225 or 235 or whatever, well, you got to find a way to make 185 work for you harder. Like there's actually almost yeah. like some creativity that could go with that. So I, I, you know, I, I, you know, maybe they were using that in that situation at Nebraska. I, I, I would doubt it, but it, it would be, I think that could also be almost, you know, like a resourcefulness thing too. If you ever were in that situation where you intentionally only had like even 45s and you got to figure out a way to make 135 as heavy and challenging as you can in an explosive manner, maybe you just crank oscillations out and find ways to yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, so when actually when I was at UC Davis, like it, we, we had the weights, not saying that we didn't have weights, but <laughs> I program, I program, program in the four, I think about four weeks, the percentage every week was the same. Nothing changed. Uh, what changed was our, and we just, I just found ways to make, I wanted to use ways to make that same weight get more of a stimulus and so it was all right we're doing eccentric so we're going give me three seconds on the way down this week the next week it was all right give me five seconds on the way down this week we made that same weight that they control heavier and then we move into that oscillating of all right you got three bounces this week next week we got four bounces and that's still the same weight and then even coming out of that say if you wanted to add in um vbt on the end Throw some tendos on it. Now we're moving that same that same weight, that same exact weight, those same percentages. Now we're moving faster, and that is it is definitely resourcefulness. Um, and it's something that I try to actually teach my guys that I work with now because they may not have, they may go somewhere, they may not have tens, they may not have fives or or whatever, and they got to figure that out. How do I? I got this weight. How could I make this weight work for me? Because this is all I got, and I got to figure it out. Yeah, that's a good point. One of the things that one the reason that I use one fifteen with with the the athlete that I was speaking of is that I did not I wasn't present at every training session that he had. I knew he could handle one fifteen fine. It was kind of an experiment. We weren't sure what we were going to get. Um, so we stayed with that for a while to see what the results were until we got uh, to that first test. That well, actually the second test after the preliminary test. Um, so we knew it was working. And rather than change it, 
uh, and since I wasn't there every time to, to observe what he was doing, we stay with it to see where we take us. And it, it, it took us to a pretty good spot. Yeah, I, I love that. I was just thinking too about you know, Dan, John, he had mentioned or he mentions a lot like resourcefulness. Like what if you don't have half of your equipment in the weight room? What do you do? How do you put a program together? And I just think that you know, maybe that, that would be a, a forced, if you're going to induce a forced resourcefulness, you could just, you could just, you know, pull a, uh, take all the fives and tens and two and a halves out and have to find a way to oscillate and work with it to jump up. But I was also thinking too about uh, the Bonder Chuck training programs in those um, developmental complexes, or I, I'm not sure if that's the exact name, but basically you have your exercises, sets and reps, and nothing changes until you adapt. Like your your throw goes up throughout the cycle, and then it starts going down enough days in a row that you cut the cycle. And in those cycles, Bonder Chuck wouldn't, you wouldn't increase the weights. Like you squat, whatever it is, like 225 or whatever, the whole cycle. And what I think like Derek Evely was doing, who had learned from Bonder Chuck, and I think a few others were... Uh, putting a tendo on. So instead of like increasing the weight, they just saw, all right, well, how much faster are you moving the weight across the course of this uh, developmental cycle? And so, yeah, I just, um, it was just interesting to think about that, but also think about, yeah, I, I just, it's just, it's just so common. I mean, again, it's not that it's wrong at all. It's just how we do it is, well, mm-hmm. how you typically do it is you just go in the weight room and every week you just put five, 10 more pounds on the bar. <laughs> and, in, and in its own way, that's fine. That's great. But I think there's also other ways to do it. Like you could add another bounce each week and then you're improving. You, you just, you, you have ways you see and feel the improvement. But I think it's, it's cool because the oscillating stuff gives you other ways to measure improvement that also fit with athletic, uh, very, a very athletic frame of the adaptation as well. Uh, Absolutely. I agree with that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, hopefully a lot of creative ideas or I know a lot of creative ideas coming out of this show. I, I'd be interested to see, um, you know, where where people listening take that if they end up implementing that kind of thing as well. Because, again, I, I feel like this is a younger uh, modality, but but it offers just so much uh, cre- both creative and intuitive use for a coach. Um, you know, Sheldon, I, I did say I was going to ask you this, so I'll, I'll ask you this here. I, I know we're kind of running out toward, towards the end of the questions, but you had mentioned using this in the scope of powerlifting. Uh, and so, yeah, just curious how that shook out with just more heavyweight, so more on that very strength side of it all. Yeah, it, it, it did the same thing. It did the same thing that it did when I used lighter weights or someone was to use lighter weights. It made the transmission of force way much more direct um i wasn't losing i wasn't losing reps or 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 force in my tendons anymore they were getting transmitted and going through the force so like i was like looking at or looking when i was really heavy into powerlifting and and um uh when i was an intern at duke um i was just kind of dove down rabbit holes did a lot of box squats uh, and try to get a rate of force development from that um and, and once I started doing oscillating, it kind of dawned on me that no matter if I have really great, like I have really my muscles are producing force so fast, if the things that they're attached to are moving, then it doesn't really matter. And that's when and then like the things for the tendon elasticity, that amortization phase, which I think for for powerlifting. The amortization phase is like kind of like the redheaded stepchild that no one talks about. That's the piece that I think that a lot of them could benefit from that they're missing. Because yeah, you do you see box squats, you'll see um, you just see all these different type of modalities. But if one of those guys started to oscillate and their tendons started to 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 um, to change and it became more elastic, the weight. For me to be able to go from 365 to 410 in seven weeks, that's it, that's crazy. Like mm-hmm. I, I yeah. never thought that's something that I would do um, personally. Uh, if there was someone who was an actual power lifter uh, to do that, yeah, I would be very interested to see what to see what they what would happen for them. Like if if that's their plateau, if that's what's holding them back from hitting this crazy these crazy numbers or if they've been adding slowly adding five to 10 pounds every year on their squat is that is oscillating that thing that they're missing 
that's going to make them take a bigger leap forward by training their tendons to transmit the force better. Um, that's just kind of like it. I think it works well with squat. Um, one of my coaches, isolating bitch uh, bench program, and I've been like dragging my feet on it, but something I'll definitely want to get around to. Um, and deadlift is a little bit tricky just because like the levers and like low back and weakness, like whatever weak spots in the chains could be. Um, but I mean, if you're doing sumo, it'll probably be very similar to doing squat um, versus oscillating with conventional. But it's something I would I'd be down to dabble with at some point in time. Yeah. So uh, just quickly before we get out of here, and Sheldon, you mentioned the tendon. And you know, I was just curious, uh, both of you guys take on uh, using this method and uh, like, what's the, I guess maybe if there's like a line, like in the sense of uh, like with Keith Barr, and I know this, I think this was in your presentation, Sheldon, but like mm -hmm. heavy, slower work for more like health. And then you have all the fast stuff. And so I, I'm just curious, like ratio of using this to something that's a little bit like slower, like just a, uh, like a static isometric or long duration isometrics or slower tempo type work for, um, so any thoughts on the mix of oscillating with more, I guess you could say health based lifting like slower reps bodybuilding whatever uh ratio of what you have in the program uh based off of tendons tendon health athlete health and and those elements um when i when i was at uc davis and i used it um out of the whole training year so i guess the school year that we were training i only used oscillating uh two to three weeks in the fall and then uh, two to three weeks in the uh, in the spring during season, um, because I was, I mean during 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 the season they're getting a lot of high reps, a lot of force production, this and that. Like I didn't, and their tendons are I would assume their tendons are getting more elastic as they're going through their uh, their season and they're gaining speed. I don't want to try to do something that might some someone pull a hamstring. Um, so I was a little bit more cautious with it. Uh, and then I did, I would also um, keep that eccentric phase before that. So I'm kind of breaking down a lot of those uh, connections. And then I build them while the body is building them up. We're also adding in extra stimulus with oscillating. Because um, we went straight from two weeks of eccentric to the two weeks of uh, of oscillating two or three weeks of oscillating. So while our body is repairing all that soreness that we got from doing the eccentrics, we're adding on, we're adding scoops of ice cream of, of oscillating on top of it. Um, and, but uh, those, those exercises, those protective ones are definitely something that I think has, that should be a piece of it. I don't, I did six weeks of oscillating, um, and prep for my presentation. And afterwards, I felt it. Um, I was definitely, definitely tight. Um, I was very, I was very strong, but my quads were so tight, my hamstrings and everything was so tight. Um, it just it, things became painful, and I was like, okay, I probably should have a stretched more. B did that eccentric phase that I didn't, that I normally do. Uh, I just didn't. Um, when I was training field teams in particular, we're, we're not going to you know, track and field is totally different because of the periodization you use for it. But um, training your field teams, or lacrosse, your soccer teams, whatever, um, I trained oscillation uh, lifts and static slower lifts concurrently for a period of time. As we got closer to competition, we basically began to change the ratio. It was about a two-third, one-third um, slower lift to begin with. It turned into a two-third, one-third oscillatory lift. Then it became oscillations in ballistics as we got closer to um, to the uh, competition season. Uh, then I maintained during the competition season, I would do one day of limited oscillations uh, every 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 week uh, during during the season. Cool. Yeah, it's helpful to get those anecdotes with 
Yeah, just because it's like once you get something that's really powerful, part of the art of it all is learning how, when, where, how much, <laughs> with what yeah. athletes at what time. So, um, you know, I'm sure that could be, you know, if we went into all the case studies, anecdotes and ways to run it, we could fill up a whole nother show with all that. But um, yeah, I think that's the end of the question list. And man, for one topic, uh, we, we really did go through a lot. And, uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from you too. I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. And so thanks for being on. I, I really, uh, really learned a lot from you guys. And thanks for taking the time. We yeah, thank, thank you for having us. Um, it, it's really, I really appreciate it because I haven't heard how this kind of origin story of how he came to oscillating, um, but it also gave me, it gave me a lot of perspective. I feel like, I feel like I'm like a Luke Skywalker and, and he's Yoda. Like I, I can hold <laughs> my own, but the amount of things that he just knows is just kind of like at a different level. So it, it's, it's definitely humbling and informative, like all at once. It's just so much. It's, I enjoyed it. Phil and I appreciate it. And also the checks in the mail to you. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank Joel, you, guys. Joel. Thanks a bunch. We enjoyed it. <laughs> thanks for tuning in to another episode of the show. It was great having you here, and we'll see you next week.